Okay, welcome to this uh, lesson from the art class online, the art class Bexley and the art class Wimbledon on abstraction and representation in painting. Now, this lesson really is to deal with some questions and sort of curiosity from students about the differences between abstract and representational painting. Um, now, representational painting, you're probably all aware of, is the painting that most people know. It represents either figures or forms um, in the real world. So it's kind of like a representational painting is a kind of mirror of the real world. Abstract painting, a lot of people have difficulty with because it doesn't uh, represent anything in the real world, but that doesn't mean to say it is not real. And uh, the first slide I want to look at is actually a cartoon. And it's by an, a famous American artist called Ad Reinhardt. Um, and it's, he did these cartoons. He was a great abstract painter. But he did this cartoon in the 1940s called How to Look at Art. And we've got a visitor to a gallery uh, saying, ha ha, what does this represent? Looking at an abstract painting. And the abstract painting actually replying to the uh, visitor, well, what do you represent? And the, the point of the cartoon is this, that um, abstract paintings like people, like human beings, don't represent anything um, they are they <clears throat> they exist within themselves like a person exists within themselves so so does a painting and that that applies to uh, not only to abstract painting but um, figurative painting as well it is it has an existence in its own right okay figurative painting can be argued is a mirror of the world it kind of reflects the world so um, the next slide we're going to look at is um, two paintings um, that I've made during my um, art practice. And in fact, it's my own art practice that in a way poses the, the question for this lesson. Um, and when I went to art school, when I first went to art school, I was a figurative painter I made paintings that were images of the real world. And uh, once I got to art school, the good thing about art school is it encourages a curiosity about images and especially about painted images. And uh, we were exposed to all kinds of painted images at art school. And I became quite interested in um, paintings that were not mirrors of the world that were abstract paintings. And in particular, paintings that were made in America, in New York, just after the Second World War, let's say the 1940s and 1950s, which came to be um, called the, the New York School or Abstract Expressionism. And so for some years after leaving art school, I made abstract paintings and um, I continued making them, um, you know, well, well into um, the 21st century, because I left art school in 1984. Um, on the left, you'll see a painting that I made um, in 2003 called Annunciation. Um, it's quite a light, it's about eight feet high and eight feet across, comprised of two panels um, of wax, okay. That painting I entitled Annunciation, and I made a, a painting in 2013, some 10 years later, which I also called Annunciation. And this um, was quite clearly more identifiable as an Annunciation. Um, it has an, uh, an angel, which is a quotation from an El Greco painting, and it has a, a film still 
from um, a Hollywood film, Where the Truth Lies. It's set in a Los Angeles apartment in the Hollywood Hills. But the, the, the point um, of this slide is both paintings bear the same title, Annunciation. One is abstract and the other is representational. The question we're going to look at in this uh, lesson is can they share the same meaning, although they are address the viewer through different modes of um, through different modes of articulation? That's the that's the question that this lesson is going to ask, and I've formulated it here. What is meant by abstract? What is meant by representation? What is meant by abstraction? How is meaning communicated by representation and abstraction? And can two paintings share the same meaning if one is abstract and the other representational? Well, let's have a look at um, abstraction first. What is abstraction? There was a very famous writer in the early part of the 20th century called Wilhelm Warringer. And he wrote a book called Abstraction and Empathy. And in this book, he argued that abstraction, and he, he kind of referred to abstraction as geometric abstraction, but there's, there's very, very different types of abstraction as you'll see later on in the lesson, that abstraction has its roots in archaic, sacred, religious ritual and represents idealized forms. So, um, the point, the point to say about this is that abstraction, we, we regard it as a sort of 20th century phenomena invented by Kandinsky. Well, on, on both counts, that's wrong. Ab abstraction um, has its roots in prehistory, um, but it obviously would not, in no way would it have been regarded as abstraction then, because there is another point of this lesson, all the all the images from prehistory that we now regard as abstraction um, are not uh, abstract. They, they were imbued with great meaning for the, the makers of those images or objects. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, two, two, forms, two forms of um, image making. One, one abstract, which is Aboriginal. Um, I'm afraid I, I the date is unknown, but it, it, it's from a traditional iconography, which is the most important thing. And one which is um, fig, a figurine, uh, which is uh, figurative. Um, now, the abstract painting on the left um, stems from a long tradition within Aboriginal culture of creating um, images and iconography that uh, represent their understanding of, of their society's relationship to both the natural world and the spirit world. Um, and in, in, in the images that they make, and some of them were originally made with sand, different colored sands, um, but uh, more recently um, with uh, modern pigments. Um, these, these images uh, basically, for the makers of them, they are ri ritual images, ritual images which we would regard as abstract, but for the, uh, the makers of them um, have huge, uh, symbolic meaning um, referred to as the dream time and the, the 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 images both kind of unite um, their ancestral forebears and the present generation so the living and the dead and it's all encompassed within the, within the, the sphere of uh, of the natural world their environment in other words um, now turning to the that's 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 an image that we would regard as abstract. Um, now, turning to the image on the right, uh, there's a there's a there's a, a wooden uh, or I think it's a wooden figurine, um, and it's forty thousand 
BC. So it's 42,000 years old. It's one of the earliest um, kind of man-made figurines, I think, to be found. And um, it's quite clearly a, a representation of um, a uh, half half man, half half animal. In fact, I think if you look closely, I think the even the the, the, the foot of the standing form has, has almost like a hoof to it, and of course the head is is the head of an animal, and um, figurative, but within the context possibly of that culture um, was made uh, to uh, uh, invoke some kind of power which uh, it was felt that those the, those animals possessed. Uh, it was a hunter gatherer society no doubt and so the art the art was performing a function even the figurative art um, and, and also the Aboriginal art performs, a, a a a ritualistic function so um the idea that abstraction is is of the 20th century and that it's completely without meaning or without any function is a, is another myth to dispel okay it's as valid and relevant as figurative imagery so i want to turn now to um, more recent times and the the way in which we kind of understand abstract, that's to say non-representational images in our own time. And uh, it, the, the traditional kind of assumption is that abstraction was um, kind of uh, discovered by a male artist, a Russian male artist, uh, Vasily Kandinsky in about 1910. This is not exactly correct. Um, the the earliest kind of abstract images that we we um, that we would describe as abstract were actually made by a Scandinavian artist called Hilma Af Klimt, and um, she lived towards the. Uh, She's making these images towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, she was a theosophist, which was a kind of a, a very common philosophy amongst artists, writers and thinkers towards the end of the 19th century. And it essentially um, was a kind of, um, it was a philosophy based on the, the unification of man with the spirit world, with higher beings, okay. And um, Hilma F. Klimt believed that she was a medium for the, uh, the she was transcribing the thoughts and ideas of a, uh, a spiritual world. And so you see here the painting on the, on the right, we have these kind of forms that they're, they're organic and they're geometric on this orange ground. Um, and you've got some kind of, there's a sort of universal symbols going on here, cross form, the circle form, this kind of serpentine interweaving, the, uh, the, the sort of a, a flower petal form, um, and these more kind of sweeping organic forms. Um, now, the another astonishing fact about these paintings are that they weren't small paintings, and she was making these in the 1890s. They're about like eight feet high, nine feet high by eight feet across. They're gigantic. And um, she would not, I think it's fair to say, she would not have regarded these paintings in the way that we regard abstract painting today. She would have seen them as messages from um another world and that she was the medium transcribing these messages um but there are some certainly some identifiable symbols that um we would recognize here i mean the the uh the the pyramid form the uh the circle these are all like the the pure solids um from euclidean geometry 
Um, so um, she was she was drawing on certain idealized uh, forms to create these, as it were, messages from the other world. And um, this this idea of the individual not just having a material existence, but having a spiritual existence was something that, that gained great traction in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, because um, the Western world was going through this huge transformation uh, from an, a kind of an agrarian society to an industrialized society. The, the, the growth of the great cities, the growth of factories, the growth of mass culture. And this, this caused many artists, writers, thinkers to have great suspicions about um, uh, industrialization and in effect, modern industrial capitalism. And uh, as you see two here, Vasily Kandinsky, who actually um, created the first abstract paintings proper that were designated as abstract and that which, which we now come to recognize as abstract. Um, and he wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art, um, which again, both he and George O'Keefe, who was working in America, um, were both uh, uh, influenced by theosophy and the idea that the real uh, goal of art, the real task of art was basically to reconcile mankind with its, uh, its spiritual existence, its, its essence. Um, now, this, this is not a new ambition. I mean, um, you've only got to go back to religious art and, and the purpose of religious art in the West, Christian religious art, was obviously as a sort of uh, an aid to um, spiritual devotion, religious devotion in that case. But then in the Romantic movement, uh, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, you had again the emergence of um, the identification of um, the spiritual in nature. You've only got to think of artists like Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and so th this was a kind of um, resurgence of um, a, a perennial um, impulse in art, um, the, the spiritualist can, as, as opposed to the material in art. And here are a couple of paintings, uh, Kandinsky's uh, uh, Cossacks and Riders, um, one of his early paintings, where you can still just see the vestiges of um, Cossack lances, a horse, just the vestiges of a horse, the, the intimation of a landscape with a hill, which is, you know, the, the brow of the hill is in this blue color, the rainbow over the hill, um, a general sense of movement and activity. Um, and on the right, we have Georgia O'Keeffe's painting. She was making these wonderful watercolors um, in the years following the 1913 Armoury show in New York, which basically premiered all the new painting that was being made in Paris and in Europe. And so O'Keeffe was exposed to this new art, the, these new abstract forms that were coming out of European painting. But again, like the Kandinsky, there's still, uh, she still retains references to, um, you know, a recognizable or an identifiable world the sun, the halation from the sun, um, what can be read as either the landscape or the sea. But again, painted in a kind of, you know, an a essential form, okay? And here we see other examples of an essential forms. She later, or oh, Jojo Keith later painted flowers. Um, but here are some of her early pieces here, this kind of, um, vortex, un unraveling vortex, um, a kind of um, the petals of a flower, um, which have a kind of universal universalism to them. And that was one of the goals of early abstraction, that it wasn't relying 
on the kind of divisions that cultures set up, that languages set up. It could be uh, read and understood by um, all cultures um, around the world. Um, that was at least one of its ambitions. Um, so you have basically a, a situation where abstraction emerges as a, um, a force in modern, modern painting, as a way of uniting both um, uh, you know, art and life to, make, to unite uh, mankind with, with its kind of spiritual essence. Now, we're going to turn now to representation and how that kind of uh, is in relationship to abstract images. Um, what is representation? Now, representational painting, uh, we've referred to previously, Wilhelm Waringer, in the same book, Waringer argues that representation in painting emerges from a more recent uh, that's to say more recent than abstraction, a more recent post-Renaissance, that's to say after 1500, awareness of human experience and generates an empathetic response in the viewer. So what Warringer is essentially saying is that uh, ab abstractions um, is, is based on, on idealised forms, on a, a kind of non-materialistic um view of the world and that representation really emerges certainly illusionistic representation emerges only when in in western europe this kind of uh, awareness of of the the human individual and the human the, the human self starts to take shape and that really only started in in the renaissance the the idea of um, the self, selfhood, that, that people had an idea of their own uh, self as being distinct from other people's, uh, as being distinct from other people, uh, you know, that the other people had their own selfhood and their own identity. That as, as, a, um, as a psychological uh, element, element um, only really emerges in, in the 1500s, the 1600s, um, before that, there's, there's, there's no sense of a general awareness of an individual self. Um, images were made up until that point for the, the benefit of the collective, that's to say, the collective of society or the church. But with the growth of the Renaissance, you had uh, an awareness amongst artists, not only artists, but writers, um, of individual human consciousness. And so this becomes very important in, in if, you can, if you can have a sense of yourself, then you can have a sense of empathy with other selves. And so Warringer's argument was that it's through figuration, figurative painting, um, these images actually encourage an empathy with other human beings, because we can understand the images, we can empathize with those images. And here are two sublime examples of um, empathetic figurative painting. Rembrandt's The Jewish Bride, painted in the 17th century in Holland, and The Return of the Prodigal Son. Um, and it's quite clear from these images, there's a great sense of, of uh, humanism and humanity. And of course, humanism is, is a form of consciousness that again arose in the Renaissance. That's to say, the, the belief in um, uh, human values as being the ultimate um, arbiter of values in the world, not per se religious values, okay? Um, although Rembrandt, it should be added, was working within a, um, a strictly religious society, uh, Puritan, you know, Puritan Amsterdam in the 17th century. Um, I'm going to speed on a bit now because I'm aware of the time. Now, how is meaning communicated in abstract and representational painting? And then this next slide is quite important. 
all meaning in painting at some level is abstract. You can see here an abstract painting by me and a figurative painting by me. All, all, all meaning in painting at some level is abstract because painting is made of marks. Now these marks are autonomous, that's to say they are uh, separate from things in the real world. So the mark is either autonomous, as in abstract painting, because, you know, the marks here, they, they don't refer to anything in the real world, so they're, they're autonomous. Or the marks are descriptive, as in this painting, where the marks are actually describing ice and a crucifix. Um, but they, the marks in the figurative painting, they're metaphors one thing, a brush mark, standing in for an object in the real world. And that's what happens in representational painting. The marks are metaphors. One thing, a metaphor is one thing standing for another thing. That's what metaphor means. One thing, a mark, standing in for another thing. So when I make a mark like that that means in the reading of the context of this trees okay so let's let's move on so we get to basically the the substance of the lesson which is how marks can be used both as metaphor but also autonomous within their own right so the painting has its own reality and now we're going to look at some abstract painting Although paintings, abstract paintings are autonomous and have their own reality, you can't have a painting about nothing. Just because it does not have a subject doesn't mean it lacks content. And that, that was said by Barnett Newman, the, 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 the maker of these abstract paintings here. So although, although you can't see any recognizable imagery, doesn't mean to say they're, they're about nothing. In fact, they're about a very great deal. In Barnett Newman's case, they're about the, the concept, the aesthetic concept of the sublime. That's to say the overwhelming quality of experience, that which cannot be represented in words or images. In the case of Pete Mondrian, we have um, a utopian idea of abstraction where he originally started off painting trees and fields and landscapes, but he reduced the, the he reduced those forms down to their essences, down to verticals, horizontals, and the three primary colors of red, yellow, and blue. And um, so, the, the, the subject in a painting is not the content, you know. You look at a, a painting of apples by Suzanne, and, you know, they're not just about apples. Um, the, the content, the content of Suzanne's paintings of apples is not the apples themselves, although they're the subject. The content of Suzanne's painting is about how how you represent how you represent what your perceptions are telling you about your experience of the world that's the real content of Suzanne's painting and how you find a new language to represent that experience of the world of what your perceptions are telling you and in in van gogh's case we see a wheat field with mountains and a suppressed tree but you know the real content of Van Gogh's painting is what 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 those what those phenomena in nature um, were were doing to to Van Gogh. What his experience as an artist was in front of those um, those phenomena of nature, and and how he reacted to it. So it's it's in both cases. It's 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 how the individual artist, how the world is seen through the experience of the individual artist. Um, and can an abstract painting share the same meaning 
with a representational painting? Well, that's the question we posed at the beginning. And um, it's, we need to just go back one slide and just bear in mind how meaning in painting is communicated. Now, meaning in all painting, let's say whether it's figurative or abstract, is communicated by its form, like say in Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, beginnings of cubism, this sort of fractured um, disruption of form. In this case, uh, the context is um, uh, different types of African sculpture and um, archaic Spanish sculpture. Uh, that's the form of the painting. In the case of uh, Kazmir Malevich, the Russian abstract painter, there is no recognizable uh, imagery. It's a black square. But, the, the, you know, it's the content of that painting. And the content of that painting is really to do with um, essences. To, uh, you know, the idea of experience in uh, art being reduced to its most fundamental essence, almost a purification of experience, which is what Russian suprematism, of which Malevich um, was a founder member, was all about. Um, it was about purifying down to essence, and that is the content of that abstract painting. But it's not just form and content that um, give meaning to a painting, it's the context. And so we have here the El Greco painting of the baptism, which is again, the, the meaning of the painting is in the form and its content, but also in its context. It, it becomes a religious painting because not only is it a religious image, but it's in a religious context, it's, it's in a church. So if we return to this question, can an abstract painting share the same mean, meaning with a representational painting? My, my argument is in, in, in certain sense, yes, because whether the image is figurative or whether the image is abstract, they, they share similar modes, they invoke similar modes of, um, uh, response and empathy um, and um, uh, 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 re reception aesthetics with the viewer. So that when we look at this painting here made 200 years ago by Caspar David Friedrich, we, we, we sense obviously a landscape, but a landscape of calmness and meditation. And when we look at this painting by Mark Rothko, Despite the formal similarities, you know, basically the rise line, Rothko, it should be said, was nothing to do with landscape painting, okay? Nothing whatsoever to do with landscape painting. Um, but, you know, his paintings were about human emotion, human drama. But we get a similar sense of um, calmness, of meditation. So, um, in the final slide, um, these are kind of the two polarities of what we've been talking about. Um, the, the painting on the left, abstract, um, uh, which references the, the verticality, references the human form. Painting on the right, figurative. Um, so both, both images are capable of representing certainly um you know human emotions which have affinities the thing the thing to say about abstract painting is that it's to do with with the marks the marks are arranged and disposed of in a different manner and i think with that uh uh slide i think we'll finish this talk thank you all for uh listening and the talk will become later available on YouTube and the lesson will go out uh, later this week. But thank you for your attention. I hope it's proved something.
to give you uh, thought for food for thought and just remember that in abstract painting it's not that different from figurative painting although its mode of transmission is different its mode of reception as to say the effect it has on you can be quite similar so with those thoughts